gentleman before this, but if you will hear ripples of shall we gather at the river of his sermon flowing through what I'm about to share, we're right on together. There's a lot in common in this. Let us pray. Gracious God, we lift up before you this day and all that we might learn or learn again about the lives of refugees, which is woven into virtually all of our lives, and how we might be good people, gracious people, hospitable people, toward others as they enter our nation and community and life. We give you thanks for this in Christ. Amen. Uh, we are embarking on a three-part series, as I understand, from Aaliyah and Jim. This lecture or talk and sharing we'll do together is really uh, kind of the formative stuff in the scriptures that might guide our thinking about immigrant refugees. The next two weeks, we're going to bring in people to speak with you about the mechanics of it, because there's lots of nuts and bolts ways that you do that to help people come here, settle, survive, and uh, live out their lives. And uh, uh, some of that, I, I, I will not today, but I could share quite a story for Sidna and myself and the Naya family that we help sponsor from Syria and their life. So uh, today is a more theological, biblical overview at the next few weeks of the nuts and bolts of how this really happens to help these people survive and thrive. Um, that river of um, life is a river flowing out of, let's say, Eden, and it's already laid right from the beginning with refugees, with immigrants. And allow me to share a couple of the stones that I stand on as I walk across that creek, that river. Uh, I grew up in a family where my mother's parents are Jewish, they are Polish and Hungarian, and at a table like Thanksgiving or Christmas, and later I came to know as I grew in my Christian faith, weirdly, even Easter, we got together, we would have a ham, and the Jewish relatives called it Coney Island chicken. <laughs> My point is, my grandfather came from Poland, my grandmother came from Hungary, they would talk to their daughters in Polish, Hungarian, and Yiddish, and English. My grandmother came from the island of Madeira, this is my dad's mother, uh, which is a little island off the coast of Africa. They are Portuguese people. Funchal, maybe you've heard of the capital of the big city on the, those islands. And they're a little darker colored uh, Portuguese people. Uh, because of the proximity to Africans and the DNA there. And are, therefore, some of them are looked down upon by the people who live in Portugal itself, the more sophisticated country. And, and my grandmother would be speaking to her two sons in Portuguese. Uh, my uncle Chris would speak back to her. He was very good in Portuguese. My dad, not so good at the speaking, but he apparently understood everything she was saying to them. Now my point in this is when these gatherings are going on, and I'm hearing Yiddish, Polish, Hungarian, Portuguese, and English going on around the table, I'm seven years old and I think this is normal. <laughs> that this is the way it is. And it isn't for everybody. But that simply was the way my life began. Hearing all these languages, it's also where I learned the phrase, and fill it in, the old, thank you, the old country. And I had to figure out, as a little child, what the old country was, because I just thought it represented them being old people. <laughs> 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 well, they're from the old country, because they're old. Uh, <clears throat> well, it wasn't. Another touchstone that I land upon, when Cinda and I were in Egypt, we went to a church, particularly Cinda went to this church, but I would go with her about once a month. I went to another sort of Assembly of God type church, which was another story. But this church also had a couple of congregations of Sudanese, and in my work in Egypt, I helped to establish, pay the salaries, and help out 
eight Sudanese Presbyterian churches in Egypt. The Sudanese people, the women are about this tall, and the men are about this tall. I was always the shortest when I was among them. They were refugees from not so much Sudan, which is now Muslim, but South Sudan, which is Christian, how ironic. And that's where the worst civil war was going on. So they were leaving there to come to Egypt. And later we're going to talk about justice and how mm, they weren't so well treated in Egypt. But it was another experience of working with refugees and immigrants, as well as Syrians. The third one I hinted at, that's the Maya family. And they've been here as of the end of February, six years. And they are now American citizens. The husband and wife are now American citizens. They live in Middleburg Heights. They bought a house. They own two cars. Their two oldest girls are in college. One wants to be a pharmacist, the other a doctor. I have no doubt they'll succeed. These are amazing, resilient people. And a fourth area that touches my life, uh, many Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday mornings when I can do this, I go to Navidad Pagan International Welcome Academy. It is a school of CMSD. It's at 46th and Clark, so you know we're not in the nicest neighborhood of the city of Cleveland. It is a school dedicated to immigrant and refugee children. And I work in a third grade class Mrs. Harris is the principal teacher. This year, of the 23 students in that class, 15 are from Afghanistan. But in that classroom, the children speak Urdu from Pakistan, uh, Pashti and uh, Dari in Afghanistan, of course English, Spanish from a bunch of countries, and Kiswahili. These are eight and nine year olds. And it's just a fascinating experience to be in a school of about 26 nations and who knows how many languages uh, that I am exposed to all this every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday mornings when I help out. So that's some of the reality of uh, immigrant and refugee staff. It's just there on the surface of my life. But I'd like you to read with me, first of all, the definition of this. If you look on your sheet, this is their updated definition of a refugee from the United Nations written in 19 to 2019. Let's read together. Refugees are persons who are outside their country of origin for reasons of fear, persecution, conflict, generalized violence, or other circumstances that seriously disturb public order and as a result, require protection. Thank you. Now, as I wrote in the next paragraph, we know that persecution can be religious in nature. Our nation is formed with the pilgrims who came for religious purposes. Ethnicity, my Jewish relatives had some miserable things happen to them in Europe, and they came to escape that in the United States. Sexual orientation, we are more aware of the whole LGBTQ plus community and transgender folks and how they're treated in other nations. In Egypt, uh, it's considered an immoral or a denigration of society. You go to jail for it, and then you have to go through these classes, and everybody knows they lie. <laughs> they go to the class, and they say they've been cured for their gayness, and then they get out of prison. Um, political persuasion, and I'm going to define that in its most broad terms. If in a nation with an autocratic kind of government, you not only say something the autocrat doesn't like, or you try to gather other people who will join you in the not liking and fighting with that, whether that's the kind of cover of your hair, or a law about gay people, or the finances, and, all, and the corruption, you hear that all the time going on in the government, whatever it is, you may have a reason to leave <laughs> because you will be arrested and or killed. As well as wars, battles, whether those are international or civil in nature, and we're seeing lots of this in Ukraine right now. People who leave the eastern edge of it toward Russia, they go to Kyiv, they go into uh, 
the, the western side of Ukraine, or they're in Poland, or some other country that come to the United States. They're in Parma. Well, a lot of them are in Parma. But I'd like you to turn to someone next to you, so you're gonna have to move over. Generalize violence or other circumstances. What does that phrase mean when you hear it? And what of those illustrations of that generalized violence might cause you to want to leave where you live and go someplace else? Take a minute and talk to you. What are those circumstances that might have caused you to leave? Anything. Not allowing your children to go to school. Yeah, which is going on girls in Iran. Girls in Afghanistan, if you come to my school, there are eight, nine-year-olds in my third grade class. The boys are doing pretty well. The girls from Afghanistan, some of them have never gone to school. Mm -hmm. Never. So we have to teach them how to sit in a circle quietly. Raise your hand. Don't talk. Pass the papers. <laughs> it's preschool, folks. It's not their fault. There are some other things. Kids can't get the education. Safety. What about gangs? Safety. What safety, domestic violence, and and in this culture, macho culture, the husband can beat you, and there's nobody to go to. It's going to help. Political unrest. Excuse me. Political unrest. Well, political unrest, and you are increasingly agitated, 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 and want the kind of freedom to express yourself. And you can't do that. What about not having your basic needs met? Is that considered violence by this definition? Um, You're hungry well, all the time? Yes, it could be a big reason that people are uh, there in camps. A number of the children I work with, they really don't know where they're from. <laughs> they never lived there. Yeah. Their family went from Uganda to Nigeria, and they say, I'm from Nigeria. And I'm looking at their document. You're from Uganda. They were born in Nigeria, <laughs> but their parents had to get out. And we have a lot of that. Syrians, the kids are actually from Turkey <laughs> um, or Lebanon. I've been in a couple of those big camps, and that'll, that'll stress your heart out. But in any case, yeah, just being hungry, hungry for freedom, hungry for food, hungry for education, hungry for a job. <laughs> to survive. So all of this drives people to feel they're harmed in some way and they've got to get out of Venezuela because it's a total mess and they don't feel they can change it. And those people, and we've had children in my class, and by the way, we talk all the time about PTSD and we're not talking about RGIs. We're talking about children who have all kinds of stress things in our school. So they had walked, I had kids in my room, they had walked over a thousand miles to get here. And they did not come to be tourists. They came with their mothers often to survive. Well, let's look at another, Roman numeral three. The word alien in, um, Hebrew is tosab or toshave. The word gur is sojourner. And those words are used to describe who? Well, surprise, Abram and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah. In fact, all of the original people that make up the nation that we call the Hebrew people are constantly moving around among people that are not their own. And let's just look at a couple of those. Um, having moved with Sarah and Lot into Canaan, there's a great famine. Well, that does it a lot. Sarah mentioned hunger. And we read in Genesis 12, 10, now there was a famine in the land. So there's no food or it's rapidly declining and your food choices are getting real small. So Abram went down to Egypt. I have a lot more to say about Egypt. To reside there as an alien, there it is in Hebrew, 
to Sade, for the famine was severe in the land. Later in Genesis, now called Abraham and Sarah, their names are now Abraham and Sarah A.H., having moved to Beersheba, which is kind of in the desert area, southernmost part of today's Israel. And Abraham resided as an alien many days in the land of the Philistines, who, by the way, apparently the Philistines, Moabites, Edomites, all those ites are in that land. And guess who the present Palestinians say are our forebears? All of them. And we were here first. Not in 1948 when the UN gave you this property. As much as, and, and I, uh, by Nazi definition, I'm a Jew. You only had to be one sixteenth. I'm half. So I would have been the way of death uh, back when. But I'm critical of Israel for the way they treat those people. And guess what? Now I'm called anti Semitic. Say what? <laughs> uh, what about humanity here? So from the beginning, we know that Abraham and Sarah, their forebears, the 12 tribes of Israel, another famine, they go, Joseph, the first great Joseph, dreamer, uh, he's now working for Pharaoh, he brings in his brothers and father, and he gives them Goshen. Goshen is northernmost Egypt, where the Nile River, which is flowing north, now fans out, and here's Alexandria, fans out. This is the best land, best agricultural land in Egypt. Might there have been for the Egyptians over 400 years some resentments? <laughs> yes, because they came, see it's all they language. They came and they got the best. So now they'll have you build some bricks for us. Um, and they survive, and they thrive, and the population grows, and Moses is the one lifted out of the water, and he gets them out of there. So, uh, there's just a lot of stories about, in fact, the Hebrew people were continuously going places, later Babylon, the whole movement of synagogues means they're going all over the world, and that's where Paul would then go, first to speak, he go to the synagogue. Well, well, if they're with the Greeks, if they're with later the Romans, if they're with people from all over Turkey, there's lots of ethnic groups there. They're always the aliens. And they've survived. And the question then is before the Jews, too, what before us is, so how will you treat other people who are in your same circumstances? Now, in the New Testament, the word xenos, as I said, this is Roman number four, means foreigner. You've heard the word xenophobia. Fear of the foreigner. Fear of the foreigner. Fear of that Maurice Goldberg coming from Poland. Fear of Francis Vida uh, Vida. That was her name in, in uh, Hungary. In our country, both my cousins are named Weeders, which I don't think is the nicest last name, but the Weeders were Vida in uh, Hungary. Uh, my grandmother, Abru, became Gorman from Madeira. Fear of them. My grandmother was called the N-word, by the way, when she came to the United States by a lot of people in the Bay. She had little kinky, dark hair. I had it too. <laughs> At one point in my life, and they called my grandmother the N-word. Um, and this little Portuguese lady. And now I want to talk a little bit about Egypt because look at the scripture. Because Mary, Joseph, and the baby Jesus, as Jim has preached in past sermons, and thank you again for today's sermon because it's all woven through this, um, they go and leave a very embarrassing situation for Mary. That's the least I can say about it. Uh, maybe even threatening for her to be pregnant and not married. They leave that, so Joseph kind of helps her escape from that, Nazareth, and they go to Bethlehem for a census and maybe to pay taxes. Uh, but in any case, they get out of Bethlehem. And they're there for a couple of years, very likely. And Herod, who isn't helped by the Magi, 
he sends down his troops to kill all the two-year-old and younger boys. The Orthodox Church believes that they got wind of the fact that somebody left. That they didn't get all the boys. And that's the justification for, and this is, this is done with camel bone, so it's not ivory, um, for this, as we say, flight, and of course we, we laugh about it because we're in the airline days, the flight of these people to Egypt to escape. The Hebrew people survived in Egypt. Uh, Jeremiah went to Egypt at one point to, uh, because he thought he was going to kill prophet. You can go to a synagogue that's dedicated to Aramea, as they say in, uh, in Arabic. And, uh, and then this, and this iconic little picture of them, or statues, you will see some one in every church. <laughs> I mean, it's in every Coptic they're church. They're very proud of it. Oh, they're very proud of it. We, we say Jesus. And so they, they have this in their courtyards and mosaics on the ground. They have icons. They have statuary. They're just very proud of the fact that Jesus saw the pyramids before you did. Because the pyramids were already there. And it may be that he understood some Coptic language. Walk the back came to understand some Coptic language, as well as Hebrew. The churches all over Egypt are dedicated to Mary. Here's another iconic uh, depiction of it, like you might see in one of their churches, all right? Mary's always the biggest. <laughs> Not because she's overweight, but because they want to really put the emphasis on that salal. Show the cameras. <clears throat> and so, and, and there's all these, the Blessed Virgin churches. Uh, but the other thing that's really kind of weird, and I'm, I'm going to try not to sound too jaded here, Can you see Egypt now and all the little dots? Can I see Jesus and all the little dots? That's everywhere they believe they went. And I'm a little jaded to tell you this, but I really think that the reason for this is if Mary and Joseph showed up there, you can make a pilgrimage there and give some money to the church because you went there. So virtually every metropolitan area has monasteries in it, around it, and Jesus, Mary, and Joseph showed up. I mean, these people were travelers. <laughs> well, it goes very far. Very young, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and you, in the book like this, you can read about a lot of these places. That, but, that's my personal book, but if somebody would like to borrow it, you're welcome to. But there, but there is something that actually is rather Calvinistic about this. Oh, what? The Orthodox are not, uh, they believe, the Orthodox believe the Bible is not the last revelation of God. They are not. The King James Version, they wrote it, I read it, that's it. <laughs> and there are people all over this country that believe that. They are not. They believe that God continues to reveal the Godhead the Spirit, Jesus Christ, continues to reveal through dreams, through revelations, in our tradition, through sermons, that the revelation continues. So for them, justifying what is not in the Bible, that Mary and Joseph and Jesus went to all these places being chased, apparently, by the soldiers of Herod is okay. And everywhere you go, You see this everywhere. And it's done with a, a certain measure of pride. They were refugees. They were there temporarily living among the Egyptians. 
and eventually in a third and a fourth dream that Joseph had, they go back to Nazareth to fulfill the scripture, he, Jesus, will be a Nazarene. And we got a whole denomination named after that. that. So this is part of our DNA as well. Now, how does this, how does this affect us? Go to page two. We, people of faith, we live the life of alien, of sojourner. Look at this scripture at the top of the page. If you, people following me, belong to the world, the world would love you as its own, because you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. You've heard the Negro spirituals. I'm not long for this world. I'm just passing through. We, in fact, are aliens in the world in which we exist. So our lives are witnesses to something different. Our commitment to Christ, our faith, our trust, our sense of the virtues and the justice of God and how are we going to live it among all these people who are aliens to us? <coughs> Philippians, we can. But of our citizenship, speaking of that, is in heaven. And it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Where are you from? Heaven. Where are you headed? Heaven. God's place. In Hebrews 11, 16, speaking of the faith of Abraham and those prior to coming in Christ, but as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Now I'm going to ask an opening question right now, and again, I want you to turn to somebody or the somebodies around you. What are some of the difficulties that being an alien, you live in X, you're gone to Y, you live in El Salvador, which is a mess, you're coming to the United States, you live in the Dominican Republic, we have a lot of people from the Dominican Republic, you think there's mostly Syrians, the number one crowd of, um, of uh, refugees right now in, in Cleveland are Congolese, from the Democratic Republic of Congo, and we have kids who speak Kiswahili. Uh, in my class from Congo. But what are some of the aspects of the life to make this move which is the most challenging, the most difficult, perhaps the most frightening to make that journey? Turn and talk about what are some of those? And you, you get a little of that when you travel. I mean, just travel. And I encourage young people, all of us, to travel. And go and be able to walk around and be a little vulnerable. <laughs> the classic one. And I overheard Kathy say, what's one of the first things that people deal with? Language. Merci, madame. C'est magnifique. Yes, language. Yeah. And I walked around the streets of Egypt. I have a doctorate. I knew what it was to be illiterate. I couldn't read any of the signs. So I learned where a tree was, <laughs> on a building. Uh, where the school was, I mean, I just learned to make my way downtown Cairo by kind of figuring out where the stores were. I'll tell you about the ones that were full of bras. I mean, it was just fascinating. <laughs> and, and you can remember that. <laughs> and you can remember that. So language is a real scary thing for people. Weather. Well, the change of the environment um, can be a big scare. And clothes? Did someone say culture? The, the way you're supposed to do it. Yeah. The kind of the way you understand you're to live. Anything else? Just David, anything else? It's a challenge. Food. 
Well, the food, yes. Learning to eat other things. Um, uh, and Lila Thomas live with us in our community. And she says, I like the food here. There's nothing Indian. <laughs> and she's right, there's something Indian. Jim. I think it would be terrifying just to be alone. No yes. family, no parents. And I'm going to say a lot more about that later, but yes. The number one thing we can be, and you're going to hear this in the next couple of weeks, is just friends. These people are incredibly lonely. Well, and what Jim said was the definition of family. If you come and you bring your six kids, you did not bring your family. You didn't bring the cousins and the uncles and the aunts. So we just define family. Differently. Yeah. And when you go into an apartment building in Egypt, all those people are related. They don't have air conditioning, so they keep their doors all open. And the children run up and down. And I've sat in the living room with a bunch of the kids. It's being translated to them. Who are your brothers and sisters? And they look around the room and they can't tell me. Because they think all those kids are their brothers and sisters. And then the mothers say, you know, this one sitting here is related to... Because they, they run around. A couple of other fears. Uh, two big fears. One is fear of authorities. Because in a lot of these countries, when the police show up, you get beaten up. It's not a polite event. They're not walking up and saying, could you please give me your identification papers? They snatch it. Uh, what happened in Tunisia that started the Arab Spring was a woman cop arrested a man who had a college degree, but he was pushing vegetable cart around. He couldn't get a job. And in the argument, she pulled his pants down. The last thing a Muslim male ever wants is to be, and I'm literally saying this, exposed. He went in front of the government building and he lit himself on fire. Killed himself. And they say, here's the spark that started the Arab Spring. He was a person humiliated by what had happened by a woman cop. And the other thing is, they fear being deported. I'm going to have to go back to everything I know better than here. I mean, I, I know of it. It's not better than here. But everything I know of my misery, my fears, my angst, um, my, my, um, that, I, that I needed to literally escape from and get on the train, get on the plane, or walk from, I'm going to have to go back to this. And in some cases, therefore get arrested and harmed worse for the leader seeing you escape. So what do we believe? Well, Jim talked about this in his sermon. This is Roman rule five, about God the Father. The Lord watches over the strangers, Zenos. He upholds the orphan and the widow. These are sort of the cliche words, they're used all the time, but these are people who are vulnerable. And God is watching over them. In Job, powerful. I was the eyes to the blind. God is saying, I was the eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy. I championed the cause of the stranger. I broke the fangs. <laughs> this is a powerful language. I broke the fangs of the unrighteous and made them drop their prey from their teeth. Here are vulnerable people, refugees, immigrants. We have a lot of our kids are from Puerto Rico. They're Americans. And actually, because they go to school, uh, back in Puerto Rico, they went to school probably half a day in English, half a day in Spanish. They're pretty good. They're getting it. They're third graders. It's all the other kids that are first graders. Okay. Uh, that I'm, I'm dealing with. I mean, and, and they, you you would not believe how they will spell the word laugh. <laughs> how would you spell if you didn't know English laugh? Not L-A-U-G-H. L-A-F. Or L-F. Looks like laugh to me. <laughs> I read it. So we are to be a people of hospitality and justice. And I'm giving you some Hebrew scriptures. I'm not going to read all of those to you. But look at Zechariah D. Render to judgments, show kindness, 
and mercy to one another. Do not oppress. Take advantage of. Another thing that these people fear is they're being cheated. And guess what? They are often. So when I worked with my family, I had to be very careful to count money with them <laughs> and to make sure they understood their money and how to spend it. Um, do not oppress the widow, the orphan, the alien, there's that word, the poor, and do not devise, see this is, this is the, these creepy people who devise evil in your heart against one another. And people who know that old folks like me, our memories are not so good, so they call us and they offer us stuff. Have you done something? No. Then Jesus is teaching in Matthew, in everything. Wow. Do to others as you would have them do to you, for this is the law and the prophets. Think about that in terms of how we might treat the immigrant and refugee. In the treatment of non-Jews, as Jesus reached out to Samaritans, Romans, Gennesarenes, the bottom of that page, you can't read it, but what it says is Matthew 25's guidance. And if you flip to the next page, it makes sense. It says, feed the hungry, and now the list. Thirsty, help them. Strangers, reach out. Ooh, that's a biggie. Naked, give them clothing. Sick, help them with that. Uh, in prison, however that imprisonment is. And for people with PTSD, I would say prison is the, the mental violence, the, the physical violence, the heart, the fears, the phobias that grow. The teachings of the apostle in the, in the epistles, in Romans, extend hospitality to strangers. And I would define hospitality here as the fullness of the welcome. When you come to my house, I do not say, please have a seat. What can I get you to drink? No, don't use my bathroom. That would be impossible. In Hebrews 12, 3, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. God's very you know, ambassadors. Finally, and this fits with Jim's sermon, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, this is one of my favorite passages, clothe yourself. Now, Clothing yourself is not about good intentions. We can have all the compassion and oh, we feel scary and frightening and they need help. But if you close your help, you, you're showing up. You're showing up. And when I would take the NAF family in to get their food stamp SNAP program and read the documents sitting with Abdul Salam, I couldn't understand. And I had to say to the social worker, would you tell me what this means? <laughs> I mean, you practically have to be an attorney. How do we expect these people fresh off the boat from Syria or whatever to understand? So show up and be kind, and with kindness, humility, meekness, patience, and folks, you just have to laugh a lot. You hug them and you laugh and laugh. And here I'm going to close with, here is the challenge that I think scripture most lays before us. Do not forget everything at the beginning of this talk. That we, in fact, are Indians in our history, in our religion, and in our circumstance, spiritually. Remember that. Because there's a whole lot of reasons that people forget. Immediately they come to that new place, and everybody knew who also was showing up as a threat. They're going to take my job. They're going to take my food. They're going to take my water. They're going to take my land. Uh, they're going to take whatever. And therefore be afraid of them. And in fact, we all showed up. I mean, we, built, we let Jim in Ohio from Indiana. It was okay. <laughs> this Hoosier. And uh, go back to the time of Lincoln. I'm reading John Meacham's book. Where people were really scared about who was showing up from another state. <laughs> I mean, literally, and why? And most of them are black. But in any case, remember, Exodus, you shall not oppress the resident alien. You know the hearts of an alien. You know what it's like. For you are aliens in the land of Egypt. 
He's speaking to the Hebrew people. Deuteronomy. For the Lord your God is the God of gods, Lord of lords. And that's when they have localized gods. The great God Almighty and awesome. And it ends. You shall also love the stranger. Shaddai. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Empathize because you were there. And then these very strong words. Cursed be anyone who deprives the alien, the orphan, the widow, of justice. Because that's another disadvantage these people have. They don't know their rights. The Maya family, when they first came here, it said, put your garbage cans out around 5 o'clock in the evening, and they must be in the next day at 5. They put the garbage can in front of their house at 5 o'clock, exactly. And the next day, they took it in at 5 o'clock because they were afraid the neighbors would say something to the police, and they would get sent back to Syria. Well, that's crazy. You forgive me, that's crazy. Who cares? But if you're that terrified that something bad could happen to you because you leave your garbage out too long, or put it out too early. So I often had to say, no, we can calm down <laughs> and work through this. So next week you're going to hear lots of mechanical stuff about how all this happens. Thank you for our time to share this biblical knowledge of who we are and how I believe our Lord wants us to live our lives, aliens that we are. Thank you all.